Anyone just joining us, I want to say uh, welcome and glad you're here. Glad you're here this morning. Excited to dive into uh, the story um, of our earth, of our creation. And uh, last time we talked about uh, how the how God formed the earth and how His affection for the world is so uh, intimate. And so He's both a God of power and He's also a God who is intimately involved in all the workings of creation. Um, and today we're going to talk about the kind of the future, kind of what is ahead of us as we look to kind of the eschaton, the fancy theological term for the end of the world. And what does that look like? And how does that affect how we live in the here and now? And so we're going to read a passage that kind of talks about that. It's from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. And just in honor of God's word, I just invite you to stand. Um, because these are, these are precious words, these are important words, and by standing we just reverence and honor them. And so, uh, Romans 8, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation wakes with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who, for who hopes what he, for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Join me in a brief word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, you're in control of all things. You are almighty, you are powerful, and you're also good. You, you come and you dwell among us. And you're here in this room today. We believe that as Christians that you are here and that you are here to guide, to instruct, to minister to us wherever we are. And so, Lord, wherever we are, from wherever we're coming, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to what is to be shared today. And may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. In the summer of 2013, I was a camp counselor at Camp Omega in Waterville, Minnesota. It was a uh, training week for the counselors. And so we went and we were gathered around this campfire late at night. And they were gathered here and the camp director sitting on the log picks up a small stone from the ground and he begins to sing, Little Rock, Little Rock, where have you been? Little rock, little rock, what have you seen? When the earth was old and new, little rock, where were you? Little rock, little rock, what have you seen? And all the college age counselors were just kind of, okay, <laughs> what's this about? And he sings it again. And then he proceeded to share with us that um, this was his way of introducing the fact that we all have a story. This little rock has a story. It's seen things, it's been through things, it's experienced things that we don't know about it. And if it could talk, the stories it could tell. And the same thing was true for us. We are not little rocks, but we have backgrounds, we have stories. And so that pro provoked us to share a lot with one another and open up and become very closely knit together as friends that summer of 2013. But I tell that story because it reminds me about this little rock on what we call home, this planet, this little rock called Earth that's hurtling through space at however many thousands of miles per hour. It has a story, and that story has a beginning, it has a middle, and that story will have an end, and we are somewhere in the middle, maybe closer to the end, who's to say? 
But everyone has an account of the story of the earth, where it came from, what the meaning of all this is, and where it's going to go, what's happening in the future for this planet, for all creatures, and for that matter, us. What's the story of this little rock? And there are three takes that I want to explore today, because I believe that when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the climate, when it comes to the planet, um, people can be passionate about the planet if they are a secular person or a spiritual person. But I believe, and what I want to do today is demonstrate the fact that I believe Christianity actually gives us the greatest resource in the world to respond thoughtfully and intentionally to our environment and its concerns. And so what I want to talk about today are three perspectives, the secular and materialist perspective on creation, the spiritual or religious perspective on creation, and then the Christian perspective on creation. And so first, let's, let's explore the secular materialist view. Anyone who's gone to high school biology class knows the story of how the earth came into being. Anyone who's gone to basic, has kind of been in, inundated with that uh, information in school. We know how the world began. In fact, the universe, we have to wind back the clock way back, way back, billions and billions and billions and billions of years, and here we have all of matter, all of energy condensed into one infinitesimal speck. And there, after heat, time, something happened, and then boom, right? The Big Bang, all of the universe expands outward from there and is still expanding, scientists say. And from that explosion, all of matter, all of the universe came into being. The recipe for stars, for planets, for galaxies, all came into being. And there, a little dense piece of matter and energy formed. And it was our sun, it was our planets, it was our solar system, and there our planet was. Planet Earth is hot rock. It cools, and over time, waters appear on the earth, and there, it's in this primordial soup, was the recipe for life. And in that primordial soup were the uh, key ingredients, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. The ingredients for simple life forms, and fast forward billions and billions of years, we have simple life forms becoming more complex life forms, and then after the process of Darwinian evolution, we have the world we see today. The plants, the animals, the vegetation, the human beings that are around you. We are all here because of this grand accident that happened billions and billions of years ago. And here we have these animals, they're called human beings, Homo sapien. And they're incredibly intelligent, incredibly bright. And they are able to use tools to a degree that no other animal has been able to use tools before, go to the 18th century or so, we have the Industrial Revolution. And in, along with the Industrial Revolution, there was incredible economic advances, incredible cultural advances, and there was such optimism at that time that look at all this we can do. Imagine the world we can create. Imagine the things that we can do in our world to make it a better place. And there was an incredible optimism about technology. And now, here we are in the present time where that optimism isn't so strong anymore. We are in a technological and cultural age in which some have termed the Anthropocene. This is a current geological age, which is viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. And maybe you can see that kind of attitude in the media. I just Googled um, stuff in the news, uh, and there's kind of the air of it is, maybe we can do something about this. Maybe if governments, of human beings, of individuals can just rally together and actually uh, adjust how they live, adjust certain policies, then we can have a climate that will not harm or hurt us and other animals. But at the end of the article, it never seems all that likely. It seems rather pessimistic. I saw articles about organizations trying to be profitable and, and also environmentally sustainable, and the article titled question, is that even possible? Articles in the news um, that talk about the fire in Australia, how Venice is flooded under exceptionally high tide, and it all attributed to climate change 
and the attitude is the hope, we can change this, but then there's a lingering thought, can we? Really? I'm not so sure. And furthermore, when it comes to changing the climate, changing the world around us, I don't think the secular materialist vision of things really equips people with the best vision of the future. Because if we consider the vision of the secular materialist, um, one, they would say that the human is just like another, is another, we're another animal. We're not um, unique in any regard. We are more intelligent. We are more sophisticated, perhaps, than the other creatures, but we're just another animal. And so, if we were to apply Darwinian evolutionary theory to this, it's the, it's the animals and the plants and the forest's fault. They need to adapt. Nature is red in tooth and claw. We need to adapt. And if they don't adapt quick enough, too bad. Why should I care about the extinction of the polar bears? They're just another animal. They didn't keep up. The second thing about the vision of this future, um, one might argue that, well, you're wrong about that, uh, that we, we should care about animals and creatures because it is their very survival that enables us to survive. It's a complex web of, of uh, environmental interaction. We need those other creatures to survive ourselves. Okay. But if we consider the ultimate end of the universe, our planet, not the universe, in a billion years or so, the sun's going to expand, become this giant red ball of fire, and the earth will be consumed and dissolved into space dust, and where will we be? We won't be anywhere. Animals won't be anywhere. What we've done for the environment, what we've done personally, culturally, philosophically, morally, will all be gone. And so what is the point of doing anything for the environment in the present time? Either we burn up in a billion years or a couple million years earlier than that. What's it matter? If the vision is so bleak and so pessimistic, why should we make any effort to the contrary? And so one certainly can be, pa uh, to be passionate in this, uh, holding this worldview. You can be very passionate about this. But what I'm saying is that I do not think it gives you the adequate tools, the adequate vision for the future. If you're going to be consistent philosophically and logically, it doesn't give you the tools to be able to work for your environment in the way you really could. And so let's consider another perspective, the spiritual or religious perspective. You know, it's difficult to make generalizations about religion, about spirituality, but I'm going to make them. <laughs> uh, most religion uh, of certain kinds uh, states that a being, a supreme being, created the earth, created the universe, uh, whether it's by war or by peace, it was created in some form or fashion. And all the creatures, all the earth was made, and life here on earth is presented essentially as a heavenly test from God or from the gods. And we are to respond in kind. We're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to be good people. Um, he's watching us at all times. Christmas is coming up. Santa Claus, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be. Good you know, he's watching you. God is watching you. God is looking at this life. This is a test. And, here, and, and it's kind of like that old evangelical pitch of accepting Jesus into your heart. If you died tonight, do you believe where you would go? You go to heaven? Go to hell. Heaven is the carrot. Hell is the stick. To beat you, if you're not doing the right thing. Carrot encourages you to do the right thing. You get to go to heaven when you die. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? So there's a huge focus on life after death as a result of this. And so many Christians, many people in a Christian tradition, believe in Jesus so that they can go to heaven. That's the main thing. That's the, the kind of uh, long and short of Christianity is just believe in Jesus and you get to go to heaven. Or be good, you get to go to heaven. Or in Eastern religions, uh, be good enough, get enough karma points, and you can uh, 
deliver yourself from the cycle of reincarnation. And by definition, you are not going to be incarnated anymore. You will be delivered from this bodily existence. You will be reunited with the all soul, with Brahma, with the cosmic universe. You'll be reunited once again, no longer in this body. And so there's a basic posture in this worldview toward matter. It's icky. You don't like matter. We don't like the body. I saw a tweet from a friend the other day. Uh, they shared it. Um, and the, the tweet was, me on body positivity. I love my skin prison. That's our attitude, right? When it comes to our bodies, we're just like, this is my skin prison. And we don't have to be even strictly uh, traditionally religious. We can think of like a cultural religion because people mostly believe in God or, or spirituality or are spiritual in some way. And when we think about the cultural attitude toward our bodies, um, is it the body that determines who I really am? What's the mantra? It's inside that counts. It's what's inside that counts. It's what's inside. That's who you really are. It's not what's outside that matters. Your body doesn't determine anything about you. It's your spirit. And so it's not hard to imagine how an emphasis on the environment or on the world, the planetary, physical, material existence, falls short in this kind of way of looking at things. There's hardly any value on the body, much less on the earth. The earth can dissolve in acidic oceans due to pollution. What do I care? I go to heaven when I die. I'm not going to be around when the wrath of God comes and descends upon the earth. I'm going to be in heaven. I'll be redeemed from this, and I'm going to be out of this darn body. I hate being in it. I'll be floating around in heaven somewhere like this cosmic spirit. And I would argue that this is actually far less helpful than the secular materialist vision of things. Because at least there, the physical matters. The physical is very important. The physical is really all that there is. Of course it matters. But here, the physical has been discarded. It's not important at all. And so why should we invest and steward the environment that has been created around us? So where we do where we go from here? I would suggest to you that the Christian story for creation, for all of the earth, all of the universe, is far different than the first two stories about our planet. Contrary to the religious or spiritual view of things, the Creator God delights in His creation. Matter isn't this icky thing. He made it. With his own hands, out of his own mind, came all of creation. When he said, let there be light separated from darkness, he said, it was good. When he said, let there be the moon and the stars and the sun to mark the seasons and the times and the days, he said it was good. When he said, let there be vegetation that springs up upon the earth, let there be animals of various kinds and fish and birds, he says it was good. And when he makes human beings... Oh, it's very good. This entire creation is very good. I love what I have made. God likes the earth. God likes human beings. God likes the physical, the material, and all this stuff that's here around us. He made it. He's an artist. He likes what he made. And this is very different from the secular vision of things. On the, on the one hand, uh, contrary to that vision, the world was in an accident, a grand accident of colliding molecules and random chance over billions and millions of years. Here in this narrative, it is not an accident. It is a thoughtful, intentional construction by a loving and compassionate God. Intentionally, thoughtfully, and artfully made. And the second thing is that we see humans are not just another animal. It says that we are made in the image of God. That we are made to reign with God. That's what that means. That we're made to reign with Him. To be alongside Him. Stewarding all of creation just as He stewards. Creating just as He creates. That is what we are called to do. And of course, when we see the plights of the polar bears and the, the shrinking ice shelf, and of course, when we see the, the shrinking of the rainforest and the impact on our environment, and we see the impact on all other creatures, of course we are impacted by that. Of course we feel compassion for those things because that's how we're made. 
We are made to be compassionate for those things. We're made to reign and to rule just like God. And of course it would impact us. It's who we are. It's in our very DNA. To be the image bearers of God. And yet something in the beginning obviously caused that goodness, the very goodness of creation, to go wrong. And that was human sin and rebellion against God that because of that sin, a curse was brought about upon the earth itself. And it says in Genesis chapter 3, 17 through 19, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So it says in the text that creation groans in Romans 8. Creation is groaning. Why? Because it was subjected to this curse. It was subjected to this futility, not, uh, not because it wanted to. God subjected it to this curse in hope that something one day would be restored. And it means that it's, uh, when it says that it's enslaved to corruption, it's enslaved to this futility, it means that it's incomplete. It's not able to be the thing that God has made it to be. It's not able to meet, reach its full potential. Only when all of creation is restored and healed will we be able to see fully what that looks like. But in order to redeem it, God had to come in himself. Redeem, God redeemed the world through Jesus. It starts and ends with him. In Jesus, the creator God becomes a creature. No greater statement can God make for the value and the beauty and importance of the physical things than becoming a physical creature himself? He wanted to be a human being. He wanted to take on that body. And while he was in that body, he didn't walk eight feet above the ground. He wasn't any different than anybody else. He ate, he drank, he slept, just like you and like me, submitting fully to his creatureliness. And he submitted fully to that creatureliness, even in death. And in the crucifixion, on the cross, he healed and forgave human sin. He forgave you. And he opened a way for the new creation to begin. Three days later, after his death, he was raised from the dead. And the opening of that tomb signaled the dawn of the new creation. The beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. And in this present moment, we have a promise that's given to us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this text, because of what it says, because of that we have received the Holy Spirit, because we have um, become a new creation by faith in Christ, of course we groan. Of course we feel the pains of creation. Of course we feel the pains of this body and life. Because this isn't how it was meant to be, and it's not how it's going to be. There's a future, there's a hope, there's a promise for redemption, a restoration of our bodies. It says in this text, Romans 8, that we are hoping for the redemption of our bodies, our adoption as sons and daughters of God. And it says that creation is essentially waiting on tiptoe, hoping, waiting, excited to see the beginning of this creation. And so the future of our world is not that humanity will be absorbed into heaven and the earth is going to be wiped away in a fiery mess. That's not how it's going to be. But it says in the scriptures that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And that's the vision for the future. That our bodies are going to be redeemed. The resurrection of the dead will take place. And all of creation, all creatures, will be made new, will reach their full potential, and will no longer be groaning and no longer be striving. And our bodies will not be the same, and neither will creation be. Our lowly bodies will become just like Jesus' glorious body. We'll be transformed in the twinkling, twinkling of an eye. And even creation's best and most beautiful here and now. Think of that place in, the, in your travels as you've gone to different national parks or mountains or hikes. The most best and beautiful places in all of creation won't even come close, won't even hold a candle to what they will be in the new creation. God's future for the planet is one that is going to engulf the entire cosmos and both reverse and transcend the consequences of the fall. How cool is that? And how is this going to look? 
couple ways of looking at this. If we were to borrow from nature, consider the caterpillar. As the DNA of a butterfly, it's inching along one day, eating leaves, and then suddenly it drops down and it's hanging underneath a leaf and becomes a chrysalis. And in that chrysalis, the body literally dissolves. And then it reassembles to become the butterfly. It's no different. DNA-wise, its structure is identical. And yet, when it emerges from that cocoon, it is utterly transformed. That's creation. That's what it's going to look like. Another way of considering this, the theologian N.T. Wright said that new creation is going to be born from the womb of the old. Or like C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Chronicles of Narnia, he says, uh, you know, comparing uh, the new Narnia to the old Narnia, the new earth to the old earth, he says this, perhaps you will get some idea of it if you think like this. You may have been in a room in which there is a window that looked out on a lovely bay of the sea or a green valley that wound away among mountains. And in the wall of that room opposite to the window, there may have been a looking glass. And as you turned away from the window, you suddenly caught sight of that sea or that valley all over again in the looking glass. And the sea in the mirror or the valley in the mirror were in one sense just the same as the real ones. Yet at the same time, they were somehow different deeper and more wonderful, more like places in a story, in a story that you have never heard but very much want to know. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia, the old earth and the new earth, was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. Isn't that cool? Do you see how hope-filled this vision of the future is? Do you see how much value it places on the material and the physical? Do you see how it doesn't divorce the spiritual from our bodies? The Christian vision for the planet, the Christian story for our planet, gives us the greatest tool, toolbox to respond with action and with intentionality in our world today, especially as it comes to the environment. First, because God not simply made creation, but also declares it good. He loves it. He loves us, and he desires its redemption. He has sent Jesus for that sake. The second thing about this story is that God has made humans different from all creation. And he appoints us to have dominion and serve the creatures, just like he serves the creatures. And so, of course, we have that response when we see the needs of the creatures around us. The third thing about this vision is that God himself he has redeemed humans in all creation by becoming a human being himself and dying and rising from the dead. And the fourth thing is that the earth was not going to be burned up in the expansion of the sun, but it will be, in fact, transformed, redeemed, and made new in the new heavens and the new earth. And, of course, we should stick around and see what that's going to look like. Of course, we should invest in the here and now because it's not going away. It's going to be here. The trees, the, plant, the plants, the animals that you see outside as you walk today will be here in the new earth. And we need to labor for them. Because God wants to labor for them. That's why he died. That's why he came back. And that's why we're here. Next week we're going to talk about what it looks like to actually labor for creation and to steward creation just like God calls us to. That is our focus next week. And so our prayer today is that may your kingdom come, Father. On earth as it is in heaven, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. Make heaven come here. Help us to be that. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much that you have bestowed so much beauty and honor upon this creation. You have loved it so much that you became one of its creatures. You became us. And you died on the cross and you rose again from the grave to open the way for a new creation to begin. And Lord, would you help us to partner with you on that journey and on that adventure and give us wisdom as to how we might be able to serve earth and all creatures and our neighbors in your name and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.